Hello, and welcome to the Military History Club's Great Battle in 10 Minutes feature. Today, because of the 40th anniversary coming up in just a few days' time, I'm going to be talking about the Battle of Goose Green. The two-day battle for the twin settlements of Darwin and Goose Green took place on the 28th and 29th of May, 1982, during the Falklands War. It ended in a crushing British victory, but it was an unnecessary sideshow fought for political rather than strategic factors and left the second battalion, the Parachute Regiment, otherwise known as Two Para, with 15 dead, including its adjutant and commanding officer. Hostilities had erupted two months earlier when, in an attempt to divert domestic political unrest by settling a long-running territorial dispute, Argentina's ruling military junta ordered an invasion of the Falkland Islands, Islas Malvinas, a British possession since 1833. In the small hours of 2 April, Argentinian commandos landed near Port Stanley, the island's capital, and after a brief but fierce firefight, the tiny Royal Marine garrison was ordered to surrender by the civil governor, Rex Hunt. Within days, a naval task force had sailed from Portsmouth to retake the islands. It numbered two aircraft carriers, nine destroyers and frigates, numerous support ships, and the troop ship SS Canberra with three commando brigade on board, 40, 42 and 45 commando, and three para. By the time it reached the Falklands in late April, the task force had been reinforced by two para, seven more destroyers and frigates, and extra support vessels. At first, all went well. On the 25th of April, a mixed force of SAS, SBS and Royal Marines, backed by the Royal Navy, regained possession of South Georgia, 900 miles to the southwest of the main archipelago. A week later, the British nuclear-powered submarine HMS Conqueror sank the Argentinian cruiser General Belgrano as it was attempting to position itself for an attack on the carrier battle group. On the 4th of May, however, the Argentinians struck back when an Exocet missile, fired from a French-built Super Etendard strike fighter, struck and crippled the destroyer HMS Sheffield, which ultimately sank. The plan to retake the islands went ahead nonetheless, and on the 21st of May, an unopposed beachhead was established at San Carlos Water on the west of the main island, East Falkland. But the day was not without mishap. HMS Ardent, a frigate guarding the landing, was sunk by bombs and more ships damaged. The Argentinians lost, in turn, 17 planes to ground fire and air-to-air -air missiles fired by sea harriers. On the 24th of May, a second frigate, HMS Antelope, was lost, and the following day the destroyer HMS Coventry and the container ship Atlantic Conveyor were sunk, the latter by an exocet which was aimed at the nearby carrier HMS Hermes. The loss of the container ship was a particularly heavy blow, as with it were lost a tent city, ammunition, fuel, and six out of ten Wessex helicopters and three out of four Chinooks, upon which the plan to break out of the beachhead depended. This was the final straw for the British government, already fearful that public support for the war was slipping and that the United Nations might insist on a ceasefire before its troops reached Port Stanley. A morale-boosting victory was necessary, and the sooner the better. On the 26th of May, at the behest of the War Cabinet, Brigadier Julian Thompson, commanding 3 Commando Brigade, was ordered to engage the Argentinians at the first opportunity. The closest target was the enemy garrison straddling the twin settlements of Darwin and Goose Green, 13 miles south of St. Carlos, in the narrow isthmus that connects Lafonia to East Falkland. A successful attack would have the added bonus of securing the nearby airfield from which Argentinian Picara ground attack planes operated and the release of 120 civilians being held prisoner in the Goose Green Community Hall. But Thompson objected on the grounds that it was strategically irrelevant. Once Port Stanley fell, Goose Green would also fall. His preference was to leave a small force to cover the isthmus while pushing on with the rest of his men towards Mount Kent, the jumping-off point for an assault on the capital. No problem, replied Major General Richard Trant, his military superior in London. But Goose Green had to be taken first. If ever there was a politician's battle, wrote Max Hastings, co-author of The Battle for the Falklands, then Goose Green was to be it. Thompson summoned his commanders and gave them their orders. 
45 Commando and 3 Para would spearhead the breakout from the beachhead on foot, advancing towards Port Stanley across the wintry landscape of frozen peat and icy marshes. At the same time, the 450 men of 2 Para would attack the Garwin Goose Green settlement, defended, according to intelligence reports, by a weak battalion of around 400 demoralized conscripts. The Paras would be supported by just three 105mm guns, all that could be lifted into position with the helicopters available. Commanding 2 Para was the fiercely ambitious Lieutenant Colonel Herbert H. Jones. Born into a landed West Country family and educated at Eton, he had done most of his soldiering with the Devon and Dorset Regiment before joining the Paras in 1980. Age 42, this was his first time in action and he was determined to make the most of it. Informed by a senior gunner that it might help Thompson to postpone the attack by insisting on more fire support, H replied, I'm not delaying anything. To support the attack, Major Chris Keeble, Jones's second in command, asked for some Scorpion and Scimitar light tanks. The request was refused on the grounds that petrol was in short supply and the staff did not think that tanks could cover the difficult terrain. The same reasons ruled out DV Volvo tracked transport vehicles, forcing the Paras to leave behind six out of its eight heavy mortars. Covering fire would be provided by the guns of the frigate Arrow, while Sea Harrier strikes could also be called in after dawn on the 28th. At 3 a.m. on the 27th of May, cold and exhausted after having covered the nine miles from Sussex Mountain, overlooking San Carlos Water in full battle order, the Paras took refuge in Camilla Creek House, four miles to the north of the nearest Argentinian positions. The plan was to rest up during the day and attack that night. Unfortunately, things started to go wrong soon after daylight, when the men heard a BBC World Service broadcast say that a parachute battalion is poised and ready to assault Darwin and Goose Green. Jones was enraged that such vital information had been leaked and told the BBC correspondent accompanying the battalion that he would sue the Defence Secretary if any of his men died in the forthcoming battle. He then deployed the battalion across a wide defensive area to meet the expected enemy air or artillery attacks. None came, but his men still had to spend another uncomfortable day out in the open. A far more ominous consequence of the old-time BBC broadcast was the decision by Major General Mario Menendez, Argentinian commander in the Falklands, to send reinforcements to the Darwin Goose Green garrison from his strategic reserve. They arrived the following morning. The attack by two para began in the early hours of 28 May. A Company was the first into action, engaging the defenders of Burnside House at the eastern entrance to the Isthmus. After a brief but fierce firefight, the Argentinians fled, leaving behind two of their dead and four terrified but unharmed civilians. By 5.30 a.m., unhindered by further resistance, A Company had reached its second objective, Coronation Point overlooking Darwin. The company commander, Major Dare Farrah Hockley, now radioed for permission to press on. But Jones, several hundred yards back, asked him to wait so that he could observe the situation in person. For more than half an hour, as the last of the darkness disappeared, A Company held its ground. Finally, Jones arrived, and the company could move again. Meanwhile, B Company had met stiffer opposition advancing down the west side of the Isthmus. This meant clearing line after line of enemy positions with grenades and small arms fire. Unfortunately, a number of posts that had been missed then opened fire from their rear, and D Company was committed to clearing them instead of passing through B. As dawn broke, the precariousness of the Paris position became evident. Caught in the open by an aggressive and well-prepared enemy, all forward companies were subjected to heavy artillery and mortar fire. When two platoons of A Company tried to advance, they were pinned down by machine guns sighted on Darwin Hill. The light now rapidly appearing enabled the enemy to identify targets and bring down very effective fire, recalled Lieutenant Clive Livingston. Although this too could work for us, the weight of fire we could produce was not in proportion to the massive response it brought. We stopped firing. Our main concern was to move away whenever pauses occurred in the attention paid to us. Farrah Hockley then tried to deploy one platoon in a flank attack, but it was hopeless. B Company was experiencing similar problems, 
pinned down by fire from Argentinian positions near Boca House to the northwest of Darwin. We were outranged, said Major John Crossland, the company commander. We just couldn't get across the open ground to get at their machine guns. And after five hours of fighting, ammunition was critical. By now, the two mortars had used all their ammunition, while the three 105mm guns were running low on shells. Worse still, the frigate Arrow had been forced to return to the relative safety of the San Carlos anchorage, and the Harriers had been unable to take off from the carriers because of heavy fog. The situation was becoming desperate. Lying undercover next to Farrah Hockley, Jones realised that Darwin Hill would have to be secured before the advance could continue. Dare, he said, you've got to take that ledge. Farrah Hockley at once moved forward with 16 men, including his second in command, Captain Chris Dent. As they moved up the hill, they were joined by Jones's adjutant, Captain David Wood. Moments later, met by a storm of fire, first Dent, then Wood, and finally the gallant Corporal Hardman were killed. Farrah Hockley and the survivors crawled back to cover. There they met the artillery commander, Major Tony Rice. For God's sake, come quickly, he urged. The colonel's gone round the corner on his own. Armed with a Sterling submachine gun and accompanied by Sergeant Norman and Lance Corporal Beresford, Jones had charged up a gully towards an enemy machine gun nest. Within seconds, he had been hit in the back of the neck and mortally wounded by a bullet fired from the hill behind him. It was all so unnecessary because machine gun and 66 mm rocket fire were gradually silencing the enemy positions on Darwin Hill. Before long, white flags appeared and 76 Argentinians were taken prisoner, 39 of them wounded. A few minutes later, in response to an urgent request from two para headquarters to evacuate the stricken Jones, a scout helicopter was approaching the Darwin area when it was intercepted and blown out of the sky by a Picara ground attack plane. B Company, meanwhile, was still pinned down near Boca House. Even before Jones's death, realizing that a flanking maneuver was essential, Major Keeble had ordered forward the support company's Milan anti-tank rockets and sustained fire machine gun units to assist. Eventually sighted at a range of 1,700 yards, the Milans were fired at Argentinian strong points with dramatic results. Taking advantage of the enemy confusion, Keeble instructed the company to advance under the shelter of the shoreline. Then, at 11 a.m., covered by a massive concentration of fire from support and B companies, D stormed up the hillside and took the Argentinian position and 97 prisoners. Keeble now told Farrah Hockley to advance on Goose Green in support of C Company. Not possible, came the reply. Darwin Hill had to be held in case of a counterattack, and the severity of A Company's casualties meant he could offer only three platoon. This had to do, and as C Company marched round the hill, a patrol was sent into Darwin to winkle out its few remaining defenders with grenades. At one point, Major Keeble was caught in the open, snared on a barbed wire fence as cannon fire burst around him. I remember thinking, I'm losing control. It was not that I was frightened. It was simply that I was the boss, the 2IC, trying to maintain the momentum of the attack. To break the stalemate, B Company marched round the airfield and moved on Goose Green from the southwest, while C and D companies made a joint assault on the schoolhouse to the north of the settlement. After a brief firefight, a white flag appeared. Lieutenant Jim Barry of D Company walked forward to take the surrender, but was killed by a burst of gunfire. Enraged, the Paras poured rockets, anti-tank rounds, and machine gun fire into the building, which quickly burst into flames. There were no survivors. Yet still, the main enemy positions around Goose Green held firm, while the exhausted Paras were low on ammunition and heavily depleted in numbers. To give them some rest and shelter, Keeble ordered his men to pull back off the ridge line overlooking the settlement. He then radioed Brigadier Thompson and asked for reinforcements and more firepower. Thompson promised him a company of Royal Marines, three more 105mm guns, the battalion's six unused heavy mortars and plenty of ammunition. In addition, two helicopters were sent to evacuate the casualties under the cover of darkness. Having been assured by Thompson that the settlement could be destroyed if necessary, Keeble's plan was to call on the enemy to surrender. If they refused, he was prepared to unleash a devastating bombardment using all his considerable firepower at 9am. 
At first light, two prisoners were sent into the Argentinian positions with a letter from Keeble written in Spanish. It informed the Argentine garrison commander, Vice Commodore Wilson Docio Pedroza, that he was surrounded and that the time had come to release the civilian captives and capitulate. Certain defeat was the only option. Back came the prisoners with the response that Pedroza had agreed to a meeting. It took place near a little hut on the edge of the airfield between Keeble, accompanied by three officers, an NCO and two war correspondents as civilian witnesses, and Pedroza and an Argentinian naval officer, as well as the Goose Green Army commander, Lieutenant Colonel Italo Pioggi. Pedroza agreed to release the civilians, but would surrender only after consultation with his superiors, and if it was done with honour. Keeble agreed. Returning to Goose Green, Pedroza signalled his intentions to General Menendez. He was to act as he thought fit, came the reply. So he did just that, marching out at the head of a column of 150 men. In full view of the British, they formed a hollow square, listened to a speech by Pedroza, and then sang the national anthem. Finally, they laid down their weapons. But as Keeble walked forward to take Pedroza's pistol, he noticed that all the prisoners were from the Argentinian Air Force. Moments later, an even bigger column, three ranks deep, emerged from the settlement. It was Colonel Pioggi and 900 men. Incredibly, two para had overwhelmed an enemy more than three times its size. In all, 1,200 prisoners were taken and 50 Argentinians killed, with many more wounded. The two para group had suffered 17 killed and 35 wounded. A hasty and unnecessary action against a numerically superior, well-dug-in foe, Goose Green serves as a salutary lesson for politicians tempted to interfere in the day-to-day -day running of military operations. But for the redoubtable fighting qualities of two para, it could have ended in disaster, a military defeat that would have lowered morale at home and encouraged calls for a negotiated peace. Thank you.